beauty of these these virtual meetings is people can just kind of seamlessly come in and it's not like walking in and interrupting an entire room. So uh, great to see uh, some familiar faces from uh, my days in the music department as well as some uh, new faces. Uh, my name's John Bartlow and I'm the uh, Director of Alumni and Constituent Relations here at Pitt State and I've got to admit this is uh, one of the virtual gatherings I've been most excited about. So uh, many, many, many fond memories from uh, my time uh, in the music department, uh, singing for Dr. Marchant and uh, playing for uh, Mr. Keeley. Uh, lots of great memories. So um, we've got a great group assembled this evening and I'll let Dr. Marchant introduce her faculty members who are on the call. But uh, we're gonna hear some updates about what is going on in the music department. And then uh, at the end of the night, don't get off the call right away because I've got lots of Pitt State goodies to give away and we're gonna drop them in the mail to you. So uh, we, we can't have a Grella gathering without giveaways, without bling. So- uh, Greg, I came for the flag. <laughs> yes, yeah, so uh, without further ado, I'll go ahead and, and toss it over to Dr. Marshawn. Well, hi, good evening, everybody. We have uh, four of us representing the music faculty here on the, on the Zoom call tonight. And uh, I think I know just about everybody, but I'll, we'll give a little, just a quick little bio on each person and uh, then we'll get rolling from there. Um, I've been here since the fall of 1979, actually. Um, right after grad school, I spent one year living in Columbia, Missouri and then a second year living in St. Cloud, Minnesota. Came down to Kansas after that and have had no reason to leave since then. And so I uh, teach organ and harpsichord, done a little music theory along the way. Um, since 88, I've been working with the choirs. And since 2014, have been sitting in 103A, serving as chair of the department. So... That's what I do here. But I'm not the oldest person on the call in terms of uh, tenure at PSU. That would be Bob Keeley. Go for it. Oh, okay. I'm <laughs> supposed to say something about myself? Of course. <laughs> well, if, you're not, if you're not too humble, yeah. I started in 78, right out of, uh, right out of doctoral study. I'm the, I'm the uh, old fart of the department. <laughs> And uh, still do jazz, still do trombone, used to do tuba, don't do that anymore. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've been here for a while and, and have enjoyed it. And like so many of us, came here thinking we'll be here for a couple of years and then move on someplace else. And, well, over 40 years later, uh, here I still sit. So, yeah. and, you know, it's a good place. And, and part of that is because of all of you. Good, good students have just been fun to work with. So... Uh, Dr. Witten, do you want to say who you are? I think I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm apparently the whippersnapper of the crew here. I've been here since 2003. I direct the uh, marching band, um, tuba euphonium, and stuff. Very good. Oh, wow. And a very popular uh, rock and roll music appreciation course, I might add. It's tough to get a seat in that class. Uh -huh. it, all 50 seats filled up on the first day again this year. There you go. All right. And then uh, Dr. Ross. Yes. Well, I have been here since 2001. And um, yeah, I did a three or four years at Sam Houston State University as uh, adjunct faculty. And I did one year at Ma Marshall University in Huntington, West Virginia. Sorry. And then I came here and unlike uh, Mr. Keeley, I was sick and tired of moving around. <laughs> so when I got this job here, I was delighted. I was thinking, I'm going to stay here and stay I have. So uh, I've been here all this time yeah, and I teach music theory and composition and all the associated classes, counterpoint orchestration, blah, blah, blah. So. Excellent. Excellent. Well, our plan for tonight is to give you a little bit of an update on some things that have been happening here. Some will be within your memory and some, uh, some not. Uh, we'll bring you up to date on recent projects, uh, mention a couple of recent retirements, and have a little bit of a look ahead to things that are uh, down the road a bit. Um, and uh, 
to do that, we'll just highlight some points uh, in the areas with which we're most familiar, starting with Bob Keeley. And can I interject something really quickly before you start, Bob? There's a, there's a chat mechanism. And so certainly if, if you have questions throughout the presentation this evening, and, and we hope you do have some questions, feel free to enter those into the chat. And then um, when we're at a transition point in between speakers, I can take a look at those and, and ask them uh, of the faculty. That way you all don't necessarily have to keep track of what questions are out there. Okay, well, one of the things we thought uh, people might be interested in were some of the very most recent retirements. One of those was Carol Dietz. Uh, Dr. Dietz retired just this, this year, moved back home to Texas where she's taking care of her granddaughter. She's very proud of that. And also, she says, reinventing her musical life. So we still stay in touch some, as we do with David Hurley. David moved to, uh, he retired this, this past year too, and he's moved down to Tennessee where his family is, and he's still writing about Handel. As a matter of fact, he had a recent publication a few months ago. So uh, he's still very, very much involved, even though he's not in the department right now. And then uh, Dr. Jones, Rusty Jones, is still here in Pittsburgh. And of course, he retired, I guess it's been about three or four years now. Uh, he's still playing some with the Southeast Kansas Symphony. And we recently featured him with the jazz band which was nice to get him out in front with his sack because he's such a great player. In his spare time, he's playing a lot of golf and I can testify that his golf has definitely improved. <laughs> so uh, the building has seen a few changes. Uh, some of them might be things that uh, some of the folks that just graduated recently would be aware of. By recently, I mean within about the last five or 10 years, but uh, some of them are newer than that. For example, the recital hall. Uh, has had some changes. As you can see, there are new seats. And uh, it was a gracious donation from Harvey and uh, Sharon Dean, who uh, he's in charge of Pitsco. And they gave the money to refurbish the seats and everything. So that was much needed. And, uh, and so the hall now has been named the Sharon K. Dean Rosado Hall. Uh, we also had an upgrade on the building with the HVAC system and got rid of all the old window air conditioners and the steam heat. Uh, some of you might remember the third floor did not have a dedicated hallway. You had to pass through 318 to get to the other side. We now have a hallway. So that's actually kind of exciting. And then there was the old freight elevator. If you can, some of you might remember that old critter that's been replaced with a passenger elevator which is very, very nice, particularly as some of us get a little older. Uh, the, fourth floor, <laughs> the fourth floor was, uh, oh geez, I guess it was really kind of a junk floor. I mean, it just had all kinds of old stuff and it's been made into a locker area. Uh, the small rooms on the side, one of which had the old practice organ, uh, that's, they've been made into offices. The piano lab is still up on, up on fourth floor. Now something that probably interests you more than anything else about McCray is the ghost. The ghost has apparently vacated the building. We even had some ghost investigators that found nothing, but there'd been no ghost sightings for a number of years. So that's, uh, that's something that's, that's kind of interesting for you. And then of course, uh, within the Rosado Hall, we replaced the old Raider organ with a Fisk Opus 106, beautiful organ. I think I'll let Dr. Mike Schott talk about that a little bit. I'd be delighted to. But before I do, I want to mention uh, one anecdote about the old freight elevator. I remember one day when some guys came to work on it and uh, it had been acting up a little bit. The beautiful thing about the old freight elevator was that you could manually stop it in such a way that you would have a downward drop when wheeling something off or on the elevator. So that was nice. But uh, it had been acting up a little bit and uh, I greeted the, the folks who were here to work on it. And, and I said, is it safe to ride it now? And they said, yeah, it's actually, it's only fallen once. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Only fallen once. So anyway, we're back to, <laughs> back to the organ. Uh, you have a picture of it in front of you right now. Uh, what, what you might not know, if you have already seen and, and experienced the instrument, is that the actual 
color of the instrument was third generation decision. It started out as a stained case. And then uh, that, the feeling was that was gonna be just a little blah in the hall. And then it became a blue organ next. Mm. Uh, because as you'll remember, everything in the recital hall was blue for a long time. Oh. The walls, the ceilings, everything was blue which provided an interesting contrast with the red seats. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the designers of the organ decided that uh, given the colors that appeared in the tiles of the lobby, that, that this shade of green would, be, uh, would make for a better transition, uh, but would still <clears throat> obviously stand out the way, it, the way it does. So then in order to keep the focus on the organ, they converted the walls uh, to earth tones. We still had the red seats for quite a while until the deans uh, stepped in and, and converted that to the, to the beautiful dark green fabric that we have now. So I think the whole, the hall looks more uh, coordinated some way uh, at this point, which is nice. Uh, this organ uh, came to us in 1995. Um, it arrived in an 18 wheeler on the first day of spring break in that year, but remarkably, there were 25 or so people who had signed on to stay there and help carry in organ parts. It was an all day project. Um, and my favorite story from the day is that um, as they were spreading pipes all over the seat backs and putting all kinds of mechanical devices in the aisles, there was one piece of the case, which of course had had been disassembled and um, wrapped carefully. There was one piece of the case that had to come in through the lobby doors and wasn't gonna make it. So they took off the doors and it wasn't gonna make it. So they took off the door frame and it wasn't gonna make it. So finally they had to pry apart the pieces of the case um, very gingerly, of course, <clears throat> carry it in and re-glue it. But before they re-glued it, um, the cabinet maker took out his pencil and wrote a note on the bare wood saying, I know, I had to take it apart to get it in here. <laughs> 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 Which um, somebody will discover someday. Someday. <laughs> Well, since that day, there have been many, many performances on this instrument, and my personal favorites are the times that we give demos for, uh, for school classes. Uh, and I've come to believe that the sixth graders ask the most interesting questions. I don't know if that's supported by any kind of research, but my personal favorites are the questions that come from the sixth graders when they see the instrument and, and hear the instrument and uh, uh, see what it has to offer. Uh, this instrument has been um, uh, played on Pipe Dreams a couple of times, uh, and it may return to Pipe Dreams in the years ahead because <clears throat> uh, since uh, the arrival of this instrument, we now have a second instrument in town by the same builder. That's a much later instrument, Opus 152. It's a much different instrument, and it's, <clears throat> it's serving the Methodist Church, um, but uh, I'm if there were a category for most Fisk organs per capita in the Guinness <laughs> book, uh, we would be all over it. And uh, I think it's a record that probably would stand forever. <laughs> so, <laughs> pretty exciting. And it's a great opportunity for students because they get to play uh, two instruments that are way at opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of design and technique required to play them. So... Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, one of the biggest regrets of my life is that I didn't find a way to talk my way into have a, having a look around Kearney Hall before it came down. I've, uh, Bob, did you have that pleasure? Oops, you're muted. You're muted, Bob. <laughs> and the hunt is on. How to unmute. Uh, there you go. Oh, you're getting close. Well, anyway. Okay, there. there you you got me now? Yep. 
Okay, yes. I actually performed in Carnegie Hall. You performed in Carnegie Hall? Yes, couple <clears throat> concerts. Well, I never made it in, and so I, but then after everything was down, and I kept hearing all these things about the, the huge instrument that resided in there, four manual instrument, and uh, I, I never got to see it, let alone play it, so I'm sorry about that. But 30 years later, um, after Carney departed, we welcomed this guy to campus. Um, I don't know how many of you have had uh, an opportunity to visit the Bicknell Family Center for the Arts yet, but certainly if you come within arm's reach of Pittsburgh, we hope that you will take the time to do that because it's, it's truly amazing. It's just a stunning facility. As you can tell, the facade is just beautiful. It glistens in the sunlight. And um, its uh, amenities include an 1100 seat uh, performance hall, 250 seat theater, an art gallery, rehearsal room, and all kinds of support spaces, uh, costume shop, scene shop, um, plethora of dressing rooms and green rooms. And uh, it's, just, it's just a dream come true. We're very, very fortunate to have it. Um, this close-up shot of the main entrance is, uh, gives you some idea of the lighting capacity that exists in the front of the building. And they have a lot of fun over there changing the colors to match whatever might be going on um, in terms of the calendar or culturally. Uh, you can be sure that on St. Patrick's Day, the front of the building is going to be Kelly Green and, uh, and so forth. But uh, they do a really nice job of keeping it interesting. And uh, it's re really, in the, in the evening, it's a brilliant um, uh, display because uh, there aren't a lot of, lot of trees around it. So you're very aware of the starkness of the, of the Kansas dark sky and, and then these brilliant lights in the glass uh, facades. So it's really something to, to see. Um, next slide will show you the uh, spacious lobby which is of course an ideal place for receptions, uh, banquets. Um, there are some interesting performance possibilities in that space as well. And so every inch of the building gets used for something. The next slide shows you the view from the stage. This is again, the, the main hall, the, the Scott Performance Hall, Linda and Lee Scott Performance Hall. Um, it's outfitted with panels and sets of curtains that can be moved uh, to tune the hall to a small degree to tune the hall acoustically. Um, and uh, the acoustics in the hall were designed by the Kierkegaard firm out of Chicago, which is, um, as you may know, just top of the line acoustician uh, work in this country. So we're, uh, again, just so pleased to have access to this facility. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the view that you're looking at now, of course, is what the audience sees. The shell is in place at this point. That's the double shell. Uh, I think we're, we're slated to have a third section if we don't already have it. Um, and that will <clears throat> increase the flexibility that much more. The next... Um, slide. Oh, there we go. This requires some explanation. <laughs> when the hall was under construction, the person who was doing public relations marketing for Crossland Construction at the time came up with what I thought was a brilliant idea. We were asked to assemble um, a small choral ensemble completely decked out in formal concert attire, holding candles, and singing a couple verses of Silent Night. And the juxtaposition was such that we had the finished product with the polished musicians all dressed up, standing next to forklifts and uh, step ladders. And you can't really, you don't really get the full effect of it here, but paint cans and, you know, saws and everything all scattered around because it was to uh, symbolize the process and where we are now and, and what we can look forward to. The only problem was uh, it was in late December and it was literally 20 degrees that evening. 
<laughs> when we had to do this. And um, as I recall, uh, the roof either wasn't on or wasn't complete. So it was a, a very strange uh, setting in which to try to sing. We knew that in advance, of course. So what we did was we recorded Silent Night in McCray Lobby. And then we did the lip syncing uh, for the video because <laughs> it would not have sounded um, uh, terrific um, had we been, literally been singing in that space. Um, but if you can imagine shivering like crazy, that I felt so sorry for the women in their short sleeved concert dresses, <laughs> um, shivering away, syncing up to uh, Silent Night while the video cameras came in on lift trucks from uh, their various positions out in the main hall. Mm -hmm. It was a fun night. Then this became the holiday greeting card uh, from the construction company. No, the that, that oh. lip syncing thing, uh, Susan, that might catch on. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I really like this photo because it gives a beautiful example of some of the options that exist in that hall, again, with, the, with their very creative approach to, um, to lighting. Uh, yeah, that's a really pretty one, I think. Those lights are a permanent fixture up against the back walls of the shell or the, in this case, the curtains, whatever's there. Uh, they, can, they can make it warmer or cooler according to the character of the music that's being performed. The next slide shows um, the first uh, collaborative performance that we had between the choir and the orchestra. Uh, it was a, uh, a grand day. Uh, we've, we all were able to fit in there without much trouble. Uh, those of you who've been around for a while and might have remembered what it felt like to have to move oak, solid oak pews in order to do an oratorio, um, we can appreciate how uh, how easy this was to set up in there. Uh, that performance had Handel and Dvorak. It was great. Mm -hmm. And in the next slide is just a bird's eye view, just slightly different setup on stage. As you can see, plenty of room for all. And the next slide shares. Oh. That was the last one. Okay, there should, have been, there should have been one more, but I'll tell you what it was. Okay. <laughs> Actually, there should be several more, though. Uh, oh, really? You have the harpsichord and the pianos. Oh, yeah, I, you know, I remember seeing those. I must, I must have inadvertently not got those copied across. Sorry. It well, says slide 18 of 35, Bob. So just keep clicking, Bob. Yeah. I'm not sure. I can, might be able to find them. It's going to take me a second here because I got to get out of this, out of this one. I know they're not on that. On While you're one. doing that, I'll just, I'll just mention that, um, and those of you who know the Bicknell know how uh, extraordinarily deep the stage area is. Uh, that was a real godsend this year because with the shell completely removed, uh, it provided ample space for the required uh, distancing that we had to have between chairs. Um, mm -hmm. So the instrumental ensembles were able to continue in there uh, without dropping a beat. It was just, it was, as I say, just a blessing to have access to that space. Susan, I can't seem to locate it. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Well, I'll, let me just tell you then that um, in 2017, uh, we welcomed to the Bicknell um, a harpsichord, a concert model harpsichord. Um, and there was a, that's what the photo was that's missing. Um, it was built by uh, Craig Tomlinson, whose shop is in Vancouver, British Columbia. It's a French double model so it's the big the full two manual full concert model instrument and uh, we put it through its paces in its first concert by programming a concert that included solo and chamber music culminating in the massive Bach triple concerto C major triple concerto for three harpsichords and strings and when asked why did we why did we do that 
we had a simple answer and that was because we could. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I don't imagine that, that there are any other schools uh, within arm's reach that, that, that even could do that. So we uh, reveled in our ability to do that. But I don't wanna tune three instruments to each other again in the future. <laughs> um, and Susan, I didn't know if you wanted to mention how we got the uh, Steinway. That was the other missing slide. Um, there was a photo of uh, a group in the Steinway showroom, actually, where we did the selection. Um, the acquisition of the Steinways for the Bicknell was made possible um, by the generosity of a group identified as the Steinway Society. Uh, and in 2015, Dr. Scott led a tour of probably 12 or so individuals to uh, New York City uh, for the selection process. Uh, and it was just a marvelous trip. We started with a tour, which by the way, I hardly recommend if you ever have an opportunity to do that. It's absolutely fascinating. It takes a couple hours and they take you through the manufacturing process from, from A to Z. Uh, it's, it's really fascinating. And then following the tour, uh, we ended up in the showroom where they had a half dozen Bs and a half dozen D grands. And that was our selection. And we um, struggled a little bit with the choice of the smaller instrument, but when it came to the D, the nine foot, there was one that just jumped out at us immediately and said, this is it. This is our Steinway. Uh, and I think of that every time I play it because it's just, mm, it's just such a joy. It's, it plays like butter in a good way and uh, sounds terrific. And everybody who comes through town has the same reaction to it. So that was, that was great. Um, I think that's what I had to say about the Bicknell Center. So from here, I think we go to, um, Should be to John. To John, okay. do you have something to say yeah. about, about solo chamber? Okay, yes, sure. I'd be happy to. Um, I'm sure most of you know about our solo chamber series. And speaking for myself, um, as someone who, you know, when I first got here, um, I was, well, let me put it this way uh, glad to get the job. Tired of moving, as I mentioned earlier, but at the same time, uh, a little perplexed as to where on earth Pittsburgh, Kansas was. And all I remember was taking my, uh, yes, this is before the internet, so taking my Rand McNally and looking it up in the index and it was like L5 and I'm like, where the heck is it? And then sure enough, there's Pittsburgh, Kansas. And, and so driving, you know, two hours south of the airport and into this little town and thinking like, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? But all of that changed after the third week and the first solo chamber series concert. And um, Susan even had asked me um, if I wouldn't mind turning pages, uh, which for some of you uh, may remember that for a while there, I seemed like I did that every concert <laughs> and I was delighted to do it. I always, I always enjoy doing that. But the thing was, is that I was so thrilled, like, man, this was fantastic music. And I got to sit next to the pianist and I, they actually even asked me to, to do the rehearsal with them. So I, for me, that I was just in heaven. And they were doing, it was a cello uh, recital and they were doing the Rachmaninoff Sonata, which again, if you know that piece, it's really more of a concerto. It's just, the piano part is just beefy and everything, anyway. And that was just the first one of many, many, many more. And all I can remember was thinking how we were hearing just these world-class pieces here. And this was in Pittsburgh, Kansas. <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't have to pay a dime. Well, turns out I had to pay 10 bucks, but whatever. Uh, actually, turn, no, when I, when I turned pages, I didn't have to pay. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, so it was, it, it was one of those things that made me just feel like, this is a job worth having, and uh, and if the, even if the teaching wasn't rewarding, this it was just unbelievable that we could get these quality uh, concerts here, and um, and then it, you know things like the the 
piano professor at my graduate school had one of the guest soloists as her teacher when she was at Eastman and I knew her and I could chat with her during between pieces because like I knew her and and anyway <laughs> it was just unbelievable and it continues um to be that way and one of the highlights and I promised Doug that I'd mention this but one of the highlights too for me was hearing things like the Turtle Island String Quartet just because of the, the unbelievable repertory that they do uh that it's you know it's not standard repertory at all it's this weird fusion of jazz and string classical string quartet playing and anyway it just became a highlight for me so that yeah and then you know and then and then again uh, just to brag on mccray too is that that wonderful hall that we have in mccray where one of the concerts was this lute player who just comes up on stage and sits down and plays his lute and everybody, even in the balcony, can hear everything that he's doing. He doesn't need amplification at all. Uh, and then another outstanding uh, performance was a guitar player, classical guitar player. And I think all of us, by the time he was done with his first piece, we were all just sort of like stunned not because of anything other than the, the quality of his playing. And then as soon as he was done playing, he started talking to us. And again, there was this degree of like, this was one of the best concerts we ever heard. And so part of it was the music, part of it was the musicianship, and part of it was the humanity of the performer himself. And so there's, all, you know, it, 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 it spoke to us in so many different ways. And it wasn't just the fact that it was music that we've never heard before. And then for me, another highlight was this um, women's a cappella vocal group from Boston, uh, whose name is Lorelei. Gibson. Yeah, thank you, Lorelei. And what I remember most about them was how one of their pieces, again, I'm a composer nerd, so forgive me, but one of their pieces I remember starting with this long unison note from about eight or six of the singers. And then the very next thing that came out of their mouth was this 10 note cluster. <laughs> and how they got from the unison to the cluster, I have no idea, but it was just this beautiful sound and such skill. And anyway, it was, just one breathtaking concert after another. And, and then um, who was the, oh, again, I forget, the, the violinist who has his own pedagogy technique, who has come here twice. Mark uh, O'Connor. Thank you, Mark O'Connor. And the first time that he came here, we had this uh, just, you know, the sort of embarrassment of riches where he's hired to do a solo chamber concert and I think it was supposed to be like two or three people, or you can correct me if I'm wrong, Susan. And then we get a request and it's like, well, would you mind if we brought six or seven? <laughs> and a vocalist. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> and it was an outstanding, you know, just, anyway. Just proves to be one outstanding concert after another. So, um, and that takes place generally, you know, that's, that's a McRae Hall kind of thing. And uh, again, the, the idea that we have brass groups in there, we have vocalists in there. And again, just like I remember, I, the, for, for me, the, that lute player sitting there playing and having him be heard flawlessly, just without any amplification or anything. It's just always blew me away about that, that place. Um, I believe, and I don't know if this is the bright you, Bob and Susan, you can correct me, but I think I'm also supposed to segue at some point into the SEK Symphony. Is this a good time or? Sure, yeah, that's fine. Okay. All right, well, I only, I'm not gonna say a whole lot about them, but um, the SEK Symphony has just blossomed, uh, certainly during the time I have been here. And I say that only because I, uh, if I'm not uh, being inappropriate, but one of the things that's really happened is the symphony has blossomed partly because of financial donations. I think that's, we ha we've had uh, gifts that have been given to it in the form of, uh, <clears throat> of uh, uh, endowments and whatnot. And then of course, uh, I mean, we've had lots of great past directors and I'm, I wanted to thank them for all their help, but certainly our current director, Raul Munguia has done just wonders with that group and his connections to other musicians around the 
hemisphere, I think that's right, fair to say, has also been such a boon. And um, one of the things that's happened is that he has uh, continued, I think this is a tradition if I remember right, he's continued a tradition called string madness. And what that does is it's a way of getting young string players here on campus to encourage them to continue in, in, in playing uh, string instruments. And also now that we have the Bicknell Center, gives them a foretaste of what, you know, what life might be like should you decide to come to PSU and, and play your uh, string instrument here uh, in the orchestra. Uh, and then also um, there's just the, uh, the, the, the sort of outreach that he has done, that, is, that, that uh, Dr. Munguia has done. And uh, I just have one anecdote regarding the, the outreach and uh, regarding that. And um, I hope it's a, a, an, an interesting one, but it goes back to 2008 when um, I'm someone who, uh, I mean, I really do love opera. I don't see near enough of the opera that I'd love to see. But I remember back in 2008 hearing about the Metropolitan Opera digital broadcasts and how they were in conjunction with local movie theaters. Well, back in 2008, strangely enough, the theaters in Joplin were not doing those broadcasts yet. They're doing them now, as I understand, or at least they had been. I hope they haven't stopped. But they weren't doing them back in 2008. And I had heard that one of my favorite operas, Tristan and Isolde, was the one up for the broadcast. And I was thinking, oh, I've got to see this. I've just got to see this. And so it turned out that my partner, Joanne, she was uh, hot to teach some students uh, up in the Olathe area. And so we made out this deal where we would drive up to Olathe and she would teach her two or three students while I was in the movie theater for five hours watching <laughs> Tristan and Isolde. And... Um, so sure enough, I get there, and uh, now it, it turns out that I, I was just a, a wee bit late, so I come in, and the, the prelude is, pl is playing, and that, that's cool. I've, I've heard the prelude before. Didn't miss any of the singing. Uh, anyway, but uh, during the intermission, they love to have these interviews with the, the, the cast and whatnot, and I remember during the first act intermission, they were interviewing Isolde, and uh, <clears throat> they asked her a couple questions about the you know the rehearsal and then they said to her we understand that the current Tristan you're singing with is not the one you started rehearsals with and how how did that go I mean getting a replacement did you have enough time to rehearse and she said huh rehearsals that would have been nice <laughs> and it turns out that the replacement for the Tristan who had become ill the replacement was one of the PSU alumni, Robert Dean Smith. And I had no idea. <laughs> I had, I mean, I had heard of Robert Dean Smith, but I had no idea that he was the one who was currently doing it. Anyway, so I got to hear Robert Dean Smith. And then what I found out later was, I think it was like two years later or three years later, is that he had come to PSU or he had come to Pittsburgh rather during the summer. And they had worked out this, uh, this uh, collaborative effort where he was going to come and be, uh, he was going to do a concert with the SEK Symphony. And um, that concert was also going to be hooked up with the Hoffman Center in Kansas City. So they were going to do the concert twice. And they figured that the name of Robert Dean Smith had enough cachet that uh, renting out the Kaufman Center would be a reasonable thing to do, <laughs> considering the status of Robert Smith in the opera world. So, um, and it was great fun because I was one of the people who got to interview uh, him on KRPS uh, before he came here, and I got to relay that story to him. He had no idea, uh, <laughs> but then I had heard about it, and he didn't know about that uh, interview with uh, his Isolde. He didn't know that she had said rehearsals. That would have been nice. <laughs> Um, but uh, anyway, you know, it was, having seen the opera, you would never know that they hadn't rehearsed together. It was just a flawless performance. But in any case, so that was one of the outstanding, of, of many outstanding concerts. And then speaking personally too, I, um, I feel very blessed because one of my sabbatical projects was a piece for choir, uh, women's choir and orchestra. And I was greatly uh, pleased because 
Dr. Marchand rehearsed the women's chorus uh, of my piece and Raul, uh, the, the orchestra, and I got to be, have the piece performed. It was a lovely performance. And I was on the same program as um, the planets. So I felt like I was in good company. <laughs> Uh, so I, that's, um, that's all I think I'm going to say about this. John, can I, can I add something real quick? Um, Absolutely. I don't, I don't think you mentioned this, but, and obviously you're going to laugh. I mean, this is something that is appealing to me, but one of the, I think, out of the box ideas that, uh, Raul has had over the last couple of years is he has, um, as most of you know, I play saxophone and play in couple local rock and roll and blues bands, Raul has pulled in yep. local rock and roll musicians yep. and to, to do concerts uh, with the Southeast yep. Kansas Symphony. Yep. And uh, I've had the, uh, the great privilege, uh, I think two times now on the stage at the Bignall Center to be able to, uh, to play with that group. So uh, it, was, uh, it was something else. It was uh, just, a, just an amazing opportunity. I think it was well received and, yep. and in, in, incredibly uh, thankful for that opportunity and and uh, for Raul's uh, willingness to think outside of the box and mix things oh, up. I, I'm glad you said that, John, because yeah, I feel embarrassed that I didn't mention that. And and absolutely related to that is no is related to is the the concert that he had at the uh, uh, the Kansas Crossing. Yes. Um, because the casino, in case you don't know. It would, yeah, at a casino, well, with a performance stage. Um, I didn't bother mentioning the casino. <laughs> it's like, well, anyway, but yeah, it's a performance stage in the back there. And what I remember most about that was how we had two of our faculty, uh, Patrick Howell, who sort of channeled Frank Sinatra, and uh, Lisa Gerstenkorn, who channeled uh, uh, Melissa Etheridge <laughs> while they were performing. And it was, it was just, yeah, pretty incredible. And then, yeah, like you said, John, there were these local rock musicians who, you know, were part of, uh, part of the orchestra. And, um, you know, it was, yeah, out, out of the box. That's a, that's you've, a got, you've got guys who don't read music and people with PhDs in music playing on the same stage. <laughs> so, exactly right. John, no, it was thoroughly enjoyable. John, you forgot who the MC was and played a trombone solo with the orchestra. Oh, well, yes, of course. Thank you, huh? Uh, yeah. Right, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. So uh, I could say you channeled Tommy Dorsey. I don't know. No, it was more like, more like Michael Buble on trombone. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, there we go. Yeah, exactly. But no, that's yeah, exactly right. And in fact, recently the orchestra actually played outside as a as an opportunity to just uh, in, you know inaugurate the whole concert uh, live concert idea, re-inaugurate, I suppose I should say. And uh, and there was another trombone solo by yours truly, uh, Rob Healy. So fantastic. I think Susan isn't Doug next. I think it's time to hear from Doug. Yeah. Hi everyone, it's great to see all these faces out there. Um, I'll probably wax slightly less poetically in the interest of time. Um, I'm gonna share a couple pictures here, or I think I'm going to, there we go. Um, first one here, uh, there we go. This is Andrew Chybowski, if you haven't had a chance to meet him. He's our new wind ensemble director and he's just fabulous. He's got all kinds of crazy energy, um, dresses like Star Wars on the weekends. He's a really interesting <laughs> dude. I, I just love working with him. But he has this set of ears that I haven't experienced really, certainly since I've been around the Midwest much at all. He, he just hears music in such a wonderful and different way. Like he interprets the classics from the band literature so differently. Uh, it, it's wonderful to work with him. That's colleague is a band director I can, I can imagine having. So he's our newest addition in band land. I wanted to show a couple other pictures of just some stuff that some of you might remember. Um, these three pictures here from something we did oh, around 2014, uh, 2012. This is uh, the movie, The Campaign with Will Ferrell and Zach Galifianakis. Um, between all the F words that were dropped all over the place, it was our band who did the soundtrack for that. We were. LinkedIn throughout the entire soundtrack. The picture below it is me 
And actually, my college roommate, Chris Fogel, who was the recording engineer, he's the person who had got a Grammy for recording Alanis Morissette's Jack and Little Pill. He did all the Aerosmith. He's done all the Star Wars movies. He's like a big Hollywood guy. And uh, he came out here to record us because he uh, the opening scene starts off with like this really kind of bad high school band playing. He goes, can you get your band together, push in your slides and purposely play really out of tune for us? And I'm like, yeah, we could do that. So they, they came out and <laughs> recorded that. And then he's like, you guys actually play really well. And he had the um, studio send sheet music faxed because it was, <laughs> but we got all this music faxed to us. And then we literally played all the underground music underneath everything throughout the movie. So that was a real fun highlight of something we did uh, with the band here. The next one, um, I guess I don't really have any pictures of it here. Uh, something else we did, CNN had a Battle of the Bands in 2014, and we submitted a video of us playing the Gangnam Style. Oh, the Gangnam Style and doing the silly dance and all that stuff. And we ended up getting, on the first weekend release that, we had 40,000 YouTube hits, and it grew to over 100,000 YouTube hits. And we were um, featured on CNN's Battle, they did the Battle of the Bands, as one of the top five bands in the country. I don't think we are. <laughs> but we better be different. We really had that down. Um, one of the things that's really great about the band program, and I'm talking a, little, a lot about marching band because it's my thing, is the, the family aspect. So we, we like to hype. We like to do a lot of things. And the band's really got a real swagger to it, for lack of a better term. And I really like keeping that. Um, so kind of the direction we're going with the band program right now is we're going to really invest heavily into – our identity in the next couple of years, and also creating even more of a family atmosphere. I think that's something that's been really important, in, you know, the interactions that we have with our, our people. And I want to really develop that more. This picture I'm showing right here is actually from the Pearl Drums website. They um, caught wind of all the good things going on here, and they sponsor our, our percussion equipment. So we get free drum heads from them. We get all kinds of equipment, for, you know, to the tune of like $20,000 from Pearl. Part of that is the success we have, but also our percussion guy, Jim, is an artist for them. So uh, we get a lot of great stuff happening there. Uh, so this is just a picture of three of our, our alumni. I was hoping a few of them would be here tonight. But um, as mentioned, what we're really all about is the connections that we have. That's why you go to Pitt State is for the connections and stuff like that. <clears throat> so... Um, what we're going to be doing next year is we're, we're going to be starting a new band. It's going to be called the Golden Gorilla Band. It's going to be a real small group that's intended to go out and do all these little alumni events for John or to do all kinds, of, just to have a group on hand to do that. So it's going to be a, a, a group with the intent of being able to do that run out stuff, but also like be a real cream of the crop high end within the marching band performance thing. A new tradition we're starting next year, uh, we're going to call it the fifth quarter. We're not the only ones doing that. Um, certainly University of Wisconsin-Madison is best known for their fifth quarter, as well as several of the HBCU bands in the South. But basically, at the end of the football game, we're going to feature the band, and we're going to start doing some singing and, you know, more traditional kind of stuff. There'll be a nice change. Another neat thing about uh, that we're going to do next year about getting that closeness among people is we're going to be doing a big, big siblings like a big brother, big sister thing, but we're trying to make it a little less gender engendered there. But basically all the freshman band members come in, we'll have an older student to kind of be a guide for them. Because, I, I, you know, one thing that happens is during your first week of class, everything's so chaotic. Band camp has been real intense. So what we're trying to do is create a, 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 a contact. So like when that nervous freshman has questions, they have a person to ask. They have someone to check on them. You know, I, I, I don't know exactly how close that the people are going to be, but I think what a great resource. And, you know, and what Pitt State's all about and what I think the marching band at Pitt State is all about is really about creating those relationships and stuff like that. So I really hope that this, uh, these new programs are going to go. So we've um, grown over the years. I've, I, I know that when I came here in 2003, the band was on a big uptick. Dr. Fuchs was doing a nice job building the band, but it was slightly under 100, I believe, when I got here. And we got the band in 2016. We were 209 people. We're down a little bit now because of the whatever COVID, et cetera. But um, we want to keep building and making this a great thing for all our alumni like you'd be proud of. So there's kind of a quick 
snapshot that's been happening in bandwidth. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's turning over to me to talk a little bit about the jazz program, and then Dr. Marchant to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, choral program. So let me get set up here. I was gone for a little bit because, whoopsie, I don't think I wanted to do that because I was trying to find that uh, that stupid set of slides that was missing and I never did find them. Don't, so. worry, don't worry about it, that's fine. Sorry about that. <clears throat> so let's talk about the jazz band a little bit and, and what we've been up to. We're not doing anything particularly new. This was a picture of our, of our one of our concerts uh, this year, in fact, I think it was the April concert. Uh, you can see, of course, you know, we're distanced because of COVID and all that kind of, all that kind of stuff. In fact, our four concerts that we usually do every year, uh, we did them all live, uh, but only the last one had any audience. So I must admit it was kind of strange announcing a tune and applauding for the soloists. And it was kind of like, what does the sound of one hand applauding sound like? Because there was nobody out there. Very strange. It was very nice in the last, as I say, in the last concert, we actually had a small audience. Of course, the Jazz Festival it still exists. Uh, it's still going strong. Many of you actually played in the Jazz Festival. Um, this year, this past year, we had to go virtual. Uh, we had about 30 bands in the Virtual Jazz Festival, which I thought was great. Normally, we're getting about 70 groups in. But with it virtual, that's, you know, I felt pretty good about that. I might add that the Texas State, who's one of my judges, came from, they had canceled their festival. Uh, just They just canceled it totally, their jazz festival. But when they saw what we did, they decided to do a virtual festival too. So it's kind of nice to be a, a trendsetter. Uh, last year in 2020, we had the Tom Kubis band out of LA. They're all first call studio players. They've been on my bucket list for a long time. It was a great concert and they were super people. Uh, and then the next week, uh, COVID, everything shut down. So we were really lucky to get it in. That was their last concert. I'm not sure if they'd done any more concerts out in Long Beach since then. Uh, so that was, was, we were very fortunate to get there. And of course, I think one of the high points was 2016 when, when the band backed up Doc Severinsen. Um, I mean, that was really exciting for me to be on the same stage with him. And I know for the band members, they, they really enjoyed it. And he was a great person. He had a great time here. Mm -hmm. Todd Hastings was kind of the chaperone and showed him around and everything. It was very nerve wracking, but boy, what a, what a lot of fun. Yeah. We also, of course, still do the Mid-America Music Festival uh, for elementary and middle school students. Uh, this year, again, that's also going virtual. I thought it might be fun to show a few pictures from the past. And although I was not here in 1966, this was the jazz band that particular year. Uh, I'm not sure who the conductor was uh, that year. Uh, he actually, they actually had a jazz festival in 1969 was the first one. And then Rusty started it up in 1974. But these, these stands are white and blue and we still have them. We don't use them, but we still do have them. And then this was 68. I'm not sure if that's Steve Harry or not. I can't tell. But there's Bill Vance, who many of you might know. And Bill is still around. He sings in the choir, sings at the Mathers Church, and uh, you know, is still active around the area. And then this one was 91. Some of you might start recognizing people like Brian Beeson and Ron Warford. And then this is a few shots from a little bit more recent. Uh, let me see. Is, is Connor in here? Connor, were you in one of those? I'm not sure. But uh, this was a little bit more recent, 84, 99, 2016, and then 2018 with our new front. Uh, that was the last one was at the Bicknell. Uh, the one to the left, the 2016 bottom left, was at the Student Center, which went through a whole bunch of re uh, renovation a number of years ago. And then the other two photos were photos taken at uh, Memorial, where we used to play all the time. So, Dr. Marchant, do you want to talk a little bit about the choir adventures? Well, yeah, we're, we're getting on, so I'll just kind of zoom through this. I, I did want to mention, because this is a fairly uh, recent addition to our offerings, that we now have an annual uh, vocal uh, competition uh, that's <clears throat> the finals for which are held in the Bicknell Center. Uh, it was established by Barbara Rondelli Perry and her husband. 
Uh, and we have uh, recorded preliminary rounds and then up to 16 finalists are invited to campus for the, for the, uh, the final competition. And it's restricted to Kansas students who are undergraduates. That's some, a unique uh, aspect of it that the grad students can't come in and clean up. It's just undergraduate singers who are enrolled in vocal uh, programs uh, at a Kansas institution. So that's a really nice um, addition. Obviously we couldn't do it this year, but we hope to be back in the swing next year. The opera program continues to chug along with uh, fully staged um, productions in the Bicknell Center and scenes that might happen there or might happen in McCray. And then I just pulled up a couple of uh, pictures here, a little walk down memory lane, because I wasn't exactly sure <clears throat> whether some folks might actually even be in these. That was a 2004 trip to southeastern part of the country. See Jessica Dole there in the front row where we had the privilege of singing uh, the church service where uh, President Carter and his wife were attending. And then, that, then it, we, we got real brave and started mounting European trips. Um, 2008, we traveled to Southern Germany. Uh, we had to go during January because of uh, timing events at this end. Uh, and the heat was not on the churches we were could see our breath while we were singing, but, but the Christmas decorations were still up, so that was really lovely. 2010, we headed to Ireland, and uh, we started uh, on one coast and worked our way across the country. Uh, people asked if I needed to have my head examined for taking college students to Ireland during the week of Pat St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> we thought of that. We kept them in a small town on uh, on, uh, on the big day, but which is really great because we got to get all the local flavor and the local St. Patty's Day parade. It was really terrific. Uh, the next slide, I pulled this one out because I knew that Bob was going to show you a picture of Bill Vance. So there's Bill Vance in 2012. And he, as Bob mentioned, he does still help us out as he can. We had just climbed the bell tower in Florence. So it looked not too bad for having done that. Uh, 2014, Scotland, another really nice trip. That's in St. Giles Cathedral, which was the end of the trip. 2016, we went to England and Wales, started in Wales, had a very busy itinerary that included Canterbury Cathedral, Ely Cathedral, Gloucester Cathedral, Bath Abbey. Uh, but we ended in uh, London and had this terrific show at the Royal Albert Hall to cap it off. And then in 2018, we decided to do something different. We stayed on this side of the globe and went to the Pacific Northwest uh, to Seattle, Victoria, and Vancouver. It was a really nice trip. And um, I should have had some wonderful photos of Vienna and Prague to show you for 2020, but we all know what happened in March of 2020. We were within seven days of getting on our flight when we had to cancel it. Mm. Uh, so we make this happen by uh, engaging in a bunch of uh, fundraising projects. And if you've ever sung in the choir, you know that uh, the annual dinners have been a, have fun for us and fun for our patrons. That's in the old ballroom. And the next slide shows you our new home where we can accommodate up to 300 dinner guests. So uh, yeah, and we don't do them in De December anymore. <laughs> Which is <laughs> really better planning. Uh, so that's kind of what's going on on the vocal side of things. Uh, well, Su Susan, if I may, I have one sh short anecdote too about how PSU gets around, the name of PSU gets around. Uh, this was in June of, I want to say, 2006. Or 2006, I was in New York City. I was seeing a friend of mine going to a new music concert at um, uh, you know some venue on the second floor of some building in Northwest Manhattan. I don't remember where it was. Anyway, and I remember hearing uh, several pieces. And after one of them, I uh, the composer was there, and I went up and spoke to with him. And uh, his name was Evan House. Yeah. And I talked with him and I said to him, I said, well, I, your name seems familiar to me. And he goes, well, uh, 
I don't know why, and I couldn't put it all together at the time. And then he says to me that, um, <clears throat> well, maybe you know my wife. Uh, my wife plays clarinet, and uh, and I didn't know his wife at all. And he goes, yeah, we met in Pittsburgh, Kansas. <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> this is too much. <laughs> anyway, it turns out, yeah, he was uh, he was a theory teacher here, and his wife was a one year replacement, and et cetera, et cetera. It was just like. That was too strange. And and just I just happened to be there. At, you know, right place at the right time. But anyway. <laughs> that, that's, that's my story. <laughs> All roads through Pittsburgh, Kansas. There we go. Exactly. <laughs> that's that's right. right. I'll say I had a, a small story that was kind of like that. I was in Manhattan, Marriott in New York City and for the International Jazz Educators Association. Uh, Mr. Keeley, I think you were there with me that year as well. And yes. I was in the elevator and this guy comes in and he's looking at me and he goes, you know, kind of doing that like, I know you thing. And I'm like, I know exactly who he was. It was Chuck Owen. He was our guest at the Jazz Fest a few years back. And he goes, trumpet player, Pittsburgh, Kansas. <laughs> I <laughs> thought, wow, like, someone's going to remember me as a little student uh, back then, but it was a pretty cool little, you know, interaction that we had on an elevator in, in Manhattan. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. No, exactly. Small world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, does anybody have any questions for uh, any of our music faculty? No questions, but great job, everyone. I love hearing all the updated news. <laughs> yeah, I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. And you're still there. I'm still here. So. <laughs> really great to see everybody. Hello, Joy Koo. How are you? Dr. Morshant. Oh, oh my God, Dr. Keeley. I just wanted to say, you know, <clears throat> I, I don't know what to say. It's been so many years. I just turned 50 today. Uh, not today, oh. this year, this year. And uh, I just want to call out that Dr. Marchant was instrumental in getting me to the U.S. when I was 18. Without you, I wouldn't be here today. So thank you. It's just oh, really sure. delightful to see Dr. Right. Keeley. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, very good. Very good. That's, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So many... So many great memories for all of us. If, if you've, anybody has seen the, the chat thread that's been going back and forth, people just uh, reliving memories, some that well, we won't be publicly. But. And I want to let Catherine know, I still have my uh, IPA book and I still use it. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. That's great. Dr. Marshawn, are there, are, there, uh, are there opportunities at homecoming that, don't we have a group of, of music uh, alumni that typically come back and, and, and meet in McRae? Yes, Gary Green has been the organizer of that. Um, and um, the alumni, I think they've done it probably, of course not this year, but three previous years. Mm -hmm. um, and they convene in McRae, I think just about as the parade is finishing up and everybody brings a dessert and some something to drink and they just sit around and tell stories and get a group photo. And yeah, it's been a really great, great event. So um, if anybody wants information on whether or not that's happening next year, just shoot me an email and I can uh, coordinate that with Gary. And, and I will tell everyone on this call, um, we will, my office will send out a follow-up email uh, probably tomorrow morning. And so, Dr. Marchand, if there are any links or anything that you want us to provide, aside from your email address and things like that, we're happy to include those uh, in that email. Uh, there'll be a lot of information uh, about things that my office does. Tonight was really about the music department. It was uh, intentionally not for me to talk about alumni relations tonight. So we'll send some of those things uh, in an email tomorrow. But if there's anything you want us to include, Dr. Marchand, just let me know. That would be great. May I ask whether everybody has gotten their e-newsletters? Raise your hand if you've gotten your e-newsletter. Because <laughs> if you haven't, it must mean that we don't have or didn't have at the last round your email address. But uh, that's, that's a new addition to our offerings, and we're excited about that. So if you've registered, I guess you get the next one, <laughs> right? 
Outstanding. Uh, Doug Whitten says we will do an alumni marching band at homecoming if you if you saw that in the chat. So uh, hmm. you know, that's something that lots of folks look forward to. We're excited to have a regular homecoming again. Huh? Fingers crossed. Uh, the date for homecoming is October the 16th. Saturday, October the 16th. So I've got a few things to give away. All right. So uh, I drew some names uh, while others were presenting. So a few things to give away here. So we'll drop these in the mail. So we've got a, we've got a Pitt State, a Pitt State cup right here. And uh, that is going to go to AJ. It looks like uh, AJ uh, got off the call, but um, I don't see him anymore. But we'll get that in the mail to him. Uh, nonetheless, Linda, we've got a uh, Pitt State mug with some uh, Grella Rose coffee in it coming your way. Okay, so that will come your way. And then we have another mug that is going to go to... Um, Donald McLaughlin. Donald, are you still? Yes, Don, you're still on the call. All right, so we've got a, another mug coming your way, sir. Got a few more goodies down here. All right, we've got some Pitt State coasters. Tylene, these are coming your way. <laughs> got to make my notes here. I feel like Price is right. Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got. A uh, once a gorilla, always a gorilla koozie with a pair of Pitt State sunglasses in it. And uh, that is going to go to Shelby. And the other pair is going to go to um, Jessica. I don't know if Jessica is still on the call. So we will get those your way, folks. Okay, we've got, this is kind of cool. This is a, a Pitt State cutting board. Oh. Pitt State cutting board. Uh, Nathan, that is coming your way. <laughs> Nathan cuts it. Because <laughs> my kitchen has so much space. Wall if you don't choose to use it, all right? We've got a uh, Pitt State cooler bag. And... That is going to go to Robin. Woo -hoo! Congrats <laughs> to you, Robin. Connor, is Connor still on the call? I don't see him, but he's going to be surprised with a big Pitt State blanket. All right. All right. Maybe we should say he doesn't get it because he got off too early. <laughs> well, I won't be mean. I won't be mean. We'll we'll do it. And <laughs> Last but not least, Aaron Smith. We've got a, got all this stuff on my floor. We've got a Pitt State umbrella coming your way. Nice. You can wear it. You can, you can wear it. You can use it there in a Louisville. <laughs> Louisville. <laughs> yeah, Louisville. Now swallow the whole word, Louisville. Exactly. You guys got the right idea. <laughs> forgetting, I went, forgetting I went to Bloomington. I know Lou. Huge, huge thanks to uh, all of our uh, music department folks for, uh, for being on tonight. Uh, I'm awfully proud to uh, say that I spent five great years in that department. So uh, many special folks there. So we'll send up a follow-up email tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Marchand, if you've got any special links or anything you want me to include, send that my way and we'll, we'll make sure and do that. Uh, as Dr. Marchant mentioned, there is the, uh, the music newsletter that comes out. So if you're not getting that, that either means we don't have a good email address for you or it's going into your junk mail. Um, but we, we actually probably do have a good email address because you're here tonight. So anyway, if you wanna get more from us and you're not, let us know. Uh, we can certainly make sure that that happens. So uh, we hope to see everybody uh, in person uh, coming up here pretty shortly. Tylene is saying that I should take a picture. Yeah. <laughs> me. I'm going to grab my phone. All right, everybody. I'll screenshot. Probably another way to do this instead of Look pointing. Look in the camera, though. Oops. Huh? Yeah, let me uh, do the full screen. Yeah, how do you do that? I don't know, but I'm going to do it like this. One, everybody do something exciting. One, 
two, three. All right. <laughs> Put that out on, uh, on social media, everyone. So uh, thanks so much. Everyone have a wonderful evening. If there's anything that our office can do for you, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, everybody take care. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.